Okay, let's go. Um, first of all, we would like to discuss a bit about video sequences and uh, optical flow and, and how to approach that and what that actually means. So let's take a look at that. The outline for the lecture today is to first to look at what is a video. And then um, for dealing with, with video, I have a, a, a nice uh, code structure in, in Python for that I would like to demonstrate. And then we will go through how to track something based on color. So color-based tracking. Then we have some background estimation, subtraction techniques, and finally some template matching and, and motion estimation. So that's what we would like to, to look at today. So a video um, for us would be a sequence of frames. Um, so we have one image at uh, t equals one and the next one t equals two and, and so on. And I don't want to, to write it on all, all the slides here. Um, and in this set setting, um, we usually have a, a very limited change in one frame to the next because it's more or less the same image all the time. There are only minor changes in, in that. And we can view that as some kind of function that takes uh, free input values. So we have the intensity of the image in the x and y coordinates. These are the positions and also the time coordinate. And to deal with uh, multiple color spaces, we will have one of these uh, uh, functions for each of the, the dimensions in, in the color space. Um, the techniques we will discuss today about uh, optical flow will only deal with uh, grayscale images, which is what the, the algorithms typically look at. So when we have a piece of video, um, there are some tasks that would be nice to be able to, to do, which includes object tracking. Um, so if you have some kind of object in an image, you are able to, to see, okay, where does this uh, person uh, move over time? in this direction or opposite or what happens uh, with the person. It can also be of interest to track the camera motion, that is to estimate how the camera moves in relation to what is present in the scene. Um, so if we have some kind of objects here, and initially we, the field of view of the camera was uh, down here, and we can now see that the objects have moved in the scene, then we can estimate how the, the camera moves from point one or exposure one to, to exposure two. And that is really interesting in, in relation to UAVs. If we want to track the motion of a UAV, if we, um, based on, on the camera equipped or positioned on the UAV, we can actually use these kinds of information to estimate how the camera is moving. There are some limitations in this approach, uh, mainly due to a camera only measures angles. And if you only measure angles in a lot of triangles, you are never, never able to, to pin, put in the proper scale of what you're looking at or the motion between the, the two uh, points here, but you can get an idea of what, the, what direction you are moving within. If you then can scale that through some other kind of sensors, then uh, we're good to go. That was this part about tracking camera motion. Then we have some uh, background subtraction. If we have a, a steady camera that looks at the same team, same scene over a period of time, we can use background subtraction or background estimation to see what is moving within that scene and what is standing still. Um, we can detect shot boundary boundaries, that is, if you have a clip or an, a video combined of multiple uh, short uh, movies or segments, then uh, short boundary detection is able to see, okay, when does you move from one scene to uh, the next and, and so on. So we can detect where these boundaries are, are because at these instances, a lot of things will change in the in the intensity image uh, from 
t equals uh, from t to uh, t plus one. I have an erase up here. Like that. Okay, so here we can detect, okay, from this time to this time of this frame, a lot of things are changing and therefore there should be this uh, boundary. And finally, we can also look at motion segmentation and that is which parts of an image is moving together. Um, I will not that discuss that uh, detail here, but uh, one of the exercises for today will be to look at some code that is able to do this and figure out, okay, if we have, uh, for instance, a, a bus here that drives in this direction and a car that goes in a different direction, then we can see these as two separate objects. Okay, probably should add some tires and, and so on. But um, in, in this case, we have two objects moving in different directions and we can be a, we can figure out which parts of the image is moving together through this mo motion segmentation. And usually you will first do what is known as uh, optical flow Um, before you will proceed for motion segmentation. And optical flow will be the last thing we, we discuss today. All right. So this part about the, the suggested code structure is you will most likely have seen some code more or less related uh, or more or less looking uh, like this if you write code in, in Python and use OpenCV for dealing with, with um, a video file. You specify an input file name and you open it using this uh, video capture uh, method of uh, CV2, where you specify the file name and then you run a, a while a true loop or a while loop until something, uh, until there are no further frames to, to pull out from this capture device. A new frame is read out here and saved and we also look at the return value and if something has failed we would bail out of the while loop otherwise we can actually do the processing and here the processing consists of just showing the, the frame and finally in the part down here we can deal with um, uh, keyboard inputs for instance Um, and this is approximately 20 lines or, or so and, and after um, or having structured like this it it functions okay to, to write and, and extend but sometimes you want a bit more structure on the code and um, my preferred way of, of writing this as maybe uh, 10 lines of code or so, but it makes it more easy to figure out what is ha actually happening uh, when and, and so on. And that structure is, is shown here. I have also pushed this information up to your GitHub repositories uh, that was created for, for this course. So you can download these two example files from, from there. Um, and the idea here is to make a new class um, I usually name the class close to what is actually happening. So that could be some background detector or whatever I, I come up with here. Here it's uh, named frame iterator because it iterates over all the frames um, that is looked at. When I instantiate this uh, class or an instance of, of this um, class, I give it the file name or the name of the video file that should be analyzed and which is uh, used up here in the, the init uh, method. The file name is one of the inputs and we open this video capture device on that file name and store it here in the self.cap. Um, so this is a capture device. And then what actually happens is I go down and call the main function of the class uh, down here and it states to do something for each frame that comes from this cell uh, frame generator. And frame generator uh, is the, the method up here. 
or it's actually a, a generator. And it's a function that can return something multiple times. Each time you uh, reaches this yield statement, it returns something from the function. And this allows the, the for loop down here to go through once. And then it calls the frame uh, generator once again. It will actually call something slightly different. Uh, and then let it continue until the next yield statement is uh, reached. And then we get the next frame down here. And the benefit of doing this is that now the main loop uh, before um, actually is somewhat simpler. Some of the lines that dealt with reading out frames and detecting if uh, this succeeded and closing of this uh, capture device, that has been removed from the main loop. So the code we're looking at uh, actually looks simpler. The part down here that uh, addresses um, keyboard actions are still present. Um, I'm not able to pull that out of the for loop and put into a function itself because I rely on this uh, break statement uh, down here uh, to cancel the process if I press, uh, I think it is, it is escape. Um, because that should be present in the for loop that it will break out from. So therefore, I'm not able to put all of this into a new uh, method that can be by itself. I think this makes it a bit cleaner, the, the code you will have to, to deal with, because uh, fewer things happen uh, when you want to, to deal with them. OK, let's uh, go on with uh, color-based tracking and see how that actually uh, works out or how that can be approached. The idea here is if we want to track a small robot like the one here, it's um, more or less a, a toy robot that you can program to do certain things, move straight ahead until hit a line or for two seconds and then turn or whatever you, you could imagine uh, it should uh, do. Um, then we would like to track this over time. And one feature that is of interest here is it is very bright. It's an, equipped with um, IR di or a bright diode up here, a color diode, uh, w which you can also set the, the color. Up. And we would use that information to be able to track this object over time. It can be done very simply just to locate the brightest pixel in the image and use that for tracking we would do something a bit more um, complicated here. And the approach we would like to, to use is to look at a part of this image, let's say this rectangle, and uh, get an idea of, OK, how does the colors inside this rectangle look like, and make a color model. Um, for this. And um, we should be able to represent that uh, color model somehow. And um, in this case, we will use that or do that in the HSV color space because it we are able to more or less neglect changes in amount of illumination or the the V value here and only look at the hue and, and saturation. And the idea here is to use what is known as histogram back projection. So for all pixels inside this region, we make a, a 2D histogram with hue on one axis and saturation uh, of the, the y axis. And then we simply count, OK, how many pixels uh, or for each of the pixels in the original uh, rectangle here, we go over and see, OK, there was one observation here, and we can see how they scatter around. And what we will do for following images is then to go backwards to take a new frame here, consult the histogram, and figure out, OK, how many uh, observations were close to that color of uh, the, the new input image, and then use that as the output value. And it looks more or less like uh, this. So um, this is a, a frame a bit later on in, in this process. 
we have the uh, location of the object down here after the robot has moved uh, a bit. So now it uh, reached this location. And uh, we would like to be able to figure out, okay, exactly where is this? And to do that, um, I have used something named um, a mean shift for, for doing that. And we'll just describe, describe briefly how that uh, works here. This is a, by the way, this is a tracking result of tracking uh, the square over time based on, on this. Um, I also have an online uh, playground where you can experiment with that and uh, upload more or less an arbitrary video and then it will try to use that in um, in OpenCV in a JavaScript implementation that is able to, to track objects. So what happens here is uh, for this uh, mean shift algorithm to work is we take the image here and we let me just erase this part. So initially it thinks the objects should be around here because the, this is the location we found it in the last frame. And then it calculates the uh, center of mass of the, or using the weight of the um, intensity function. So because the intensity function is zero here and it uh, have a much higher value over here, the center of mass will not be the center of the image, but it will be shifted in, in this direction. Okay, so far so good. Let's take a, a different color. Now we take a new rectangle centered around this uh, uh, new center of mass and we repeat that process again. And we can see more of the bright pattern down here. So the center of mass will move down here and, and we can uh, repeat that uh, a few times. And after a few iterations, it is seen to converge on top of this uh, bright dot. So this is what the mean shift algorithm is, is doing. So it calculates the, it starts at the location, calculates a new center of mass and then moves the pattern towards that uh, direction. And there's also a, a, one issue with this approach is that the window you are searching within always have the same size. So you're not able to change the radius of the circle or the height and width of, of the rectangle you, uh, you are tracking. That modification has been uh, dealt with in this uh, cam shift um, algorithm. But um, I think you can read more about that uh, if you want to, to use it. OK, any questions for this part about using color information for, for tracking? It doesn't look like any is uh, speaking up, so that's fine. Then we'll just continue with uh, with the next part. Stop drawing. So the next part will be about background estimation or background subtraction. And the idea here, that was a bit more coarse than I expected this uh, image to look like. I don't know. Okay. I just got an image in, in a bad resolution. Um, and then scale it uh, way too much up. But the idea here is that you have some kind of um, video device that uh, generates images. And a basic assumption here is that uh, 
the camera is fixed. So nothing in the scene moves apart from the big objects that uh, are walking across uh, the image and we want to, to detect. So given this uh, image here, um, we would like to compare that with some kind of background model of what we expect the scene would uh, look like. And in the most basic way, we would simply just subtract these two uh, from each other. Uh, so the background model could be some kind of average over time of all the frames we have seen, or maybe just uh, a window. Um, so if we have a, a long timeline here of, uh, of frames, then we can either make this kind of um, average over all frames or just look at a smaller set of frames uh, for, for the last maybe 10 seconds or so to figure out, okay, where does uh, this, uh, uh, what is the, the average uh, motion here and so on. Um, these two elements are compared and to, to a threshold value and any pixels that have a difference bigger than the threshold is uh, made a member of this uh, foreground mask that is a description of where motion is, is taking place inside that uh, image. There are different ways of, of uh, making this uh, background model and we'll take a look at a few of those in, in just a moment. The most simple approach for, for this. Um, oh yeah, there's a, a question here about um, uh, shadow and waves, uh, whether that will affect uh, this. It will to, to a certain extent. Um, of course, when you're looking at an image where you have some elements of uh, water and we have these uh, shadows uh, try to, to lead, delineate here, they will also be moving over time. So that if that is present in the background model, uh, then you will have an, an issue there. And how to, to do that? Okay, so so we I'll just try to draw the color of a single pixel over time here. Then. Um, if we're looking at a pixel over here, let's just take a location one here, which is situated out in the water, I would assume it would uh, fluctuate uh, somewhat uh, over time because of uh, waves and yeah, because of uh, different uh, disturbances. Um, and the exact same thing would uh, happen in, in, a, in a darker location uh, like here, it would also uh, vary over time. Then if we look at something like this, uh, a point very close to, to this boundary, um, I would assume it would go something like this and then uh, go down to, to a different level. Um, and then depending on your time or how long, how far you look back when you generate this uh, background model, um, a new observation will be compared to either the observations very far ago where you had where you're out in, in the sun or when you went down here. Um, and if you compare um, a point here, for instance, um, with uh, observation when it was uh, back in, in in sunlight, then this would appear to be moving because uh, the illumination changed at that point. So that would, of course, uh, model this. Some of the different background estimation uh, models here uh, not only track the mean value of the, the pixel intensities, but also have an idea of, okay, do they fluctuate a lot or only uh, a slightly bit? And based on that, they are able to to filter out much of the what is part of the the background um, and only detect when when things are changing in the, in a different way. I actually think I have a slide that deals a bit more with that in, in just a moment. Thanks for the question.
Um, yeah. So to look at the simplest possible uh, way of, of having an estimate of, of the background is to simply use uh, the previous frame that you uh, that we have just seen, and then compare to to the current frame. Um, it works okay if the moving objects move far uh, across uh, the frame, but uh, if we have an, an object that only moves a tiny bit from frame to frame to frame, then it might be hard to actually track that from one frame to, to the next frame. Um, and we will also get issues with uh, all small noisy parts in, in that image. Uh, so if we have um, water that is um, waving or um, uh, uh, fluctuating a, a bit, then that would also appear as, as some kind of, of motion. So we can actually do better than this. Um, and a few things to to take a uh, to take into account is that you can have a scene like this one here with um, th some trees that are moving in the wind, so they actually move forward and back over time. Um, and if we then look at a region of, of pixels here close to to the edge of of this tree, they will either have the color of the tree or the background of the uh, sky be behind the tree. So in this case, the illumination would actually more or less go something like this. We we don't have a fixed period, but uh, the signal will fluctuate between the two levels. Um, uh, like here. And both levels can be considered part of, of the background. But if something that comes in this location that is uh, different than these two levels, then okay, we have something we we need to to look into, something that sticks out from from the scene. So, it sometimes it actually is needed to also consider to to store multiple uh, levels here, and that can also be be done in in different ways. And that is actually what is has been done in this uh, example um, of the mixture of Gaussians background subtractor that is implemented in, in OpenCV. This is an image taken from uh, one of the tutorials. And it contains footage, like the video up here, of um, acquired by a surveillance camera. And this is just a single frame of, of that. But given the prior frames, uh, the algorithm is able to figure out, OK, where are the moving objects in in the scene up here, which coincides with uh, a lot of people that are moving around, uh, yeah. and, and so on. I could also put them up here. There's also a, a, some different thing that is uh, appears to be in motion here, which are this uh, warning um, tape, or whatever that is actually named. Um, because that also seems to be moving, and apparently that was not a part of the uh, background estimation. We can also see an issue here on the person up here. Uh, there's this uh, line going through the person. And I suspect that that's because we have a line in, in the original scene in more or less the same location, with more or less the same color as the uh, clothes of, that the person is wearing uh, right now. And therefore, um, this part of the, the image will not be detected as something that is moving. So we have a, a false negative in that case. And, and similarly, with the head of the person up here, uh, which is not really taking part of in, in this uh, processed image. So these are some of the limitations in uh, background subtractions, this background subtraction uh, approach, um, because what you would like to track should appear different than the background. And there are different uh, ways of doing it. There's uh, MOD2, um, still the same frames here, but that's also able to delineate the shadows of the objects that are moving around. 
I figure out, okay, what is shadow and what is actually uh, a big enough uh, change so we have an object that we are tracking. And still this algorithm doesn't know that it's tracking uh, human beings in, in this case, but it seems to be doing a better job at at least they're uh, maintaining the, the head of the person up here and, and the line uh, through it. And there's a, a further, um, a, a different method here. Um, well, uh, there are a few different ones to, to experiment with if you want to use the, the building. And in the exercises later today, you will also try to, to make one yourself with a very basic uh, background estimate. So yes, I think that was um, a quick overview of uh, the ideas behind background estimation. I, we haven't really discussed how to implement it, um, but I also think that's outside of, of the scope, scope of this, this class. We could take a further discussion of how to actually do this, but uh, I don't think it's worth pursued during the, the time we have available. And we can continue a bit here. The next thing to discuss is uh, template matching. And um, have you used template matching before? I'm a bit unsure on what has actually been covered in the prior uh, courses you have had on, on computer vision. Some have used it, some haven't. Okay. But the uh, idea about uh, template matching is to have some kind of template you would like to locate in a large image. So for instance, if you want to, to make a computer uh, game play uh, Mario, uh, it would make sense to have a small template like the one up here and then figure out, okay, where in the scene is this object located? And because we know the exact same and orientation, uh, size and orientation of uh, this template, um, we can actually slide it across and see, okay, does it fit in the position up here and then move it one pixel to, to the right and again, check, does it fit here and, and so on. Actually compare it with every possible location in, in that image. That could be computationally a, a bit heavy to, to do so, but um, using tricks from Fourier transforms, it's not that prohibitively. Um, and in that way, we should be able to locate uh, the, the template in, in a few locations uh, in these three uh, I denote here. So, yeah, um, what is needed for using a template matching is first of all the template, but also a method for comparing the template with the image and how to calculate, okay, how equal, or I didn't know, how close to each other are these two. And there are different uh, approaches for, for that. Um, a very simple one is the cross correlation uh, given up here, where you take the, the template and you subtract the intensity image of the same region and then you square all the differences and sum up over all of these. And that gives you this uh, response or match score image. I denoted R here. And the good thing about this one is that that can actually be sped up quite far, uh, quite much using uh, Fourier transforms to do this uh, kind of, of calculation. Um, so if we look at uh, a few numbers here, the input image I showed you before um, had um, had the dimension of, of 566 times 877 and three color channels and the template I'm using is 48 times 48 times three uh, pixels. Or yeah, that's color channels and, and the other are pixels. Um, and that leaves us with a number of possible uh, locations um, that the template can be put on, on top of this image. Um, if the template and the image had the same size, we would have exactly one match because then we could just plug it on, on top of that. And each pixel 
uh, where the image is larger than the template, uh, we will have one new location uh, where we can put the template on top of the image. And the calculations down here is uh, how many um, rows will there be in the output. Um, so we take the image number of rows in the image minus the number of rows in the template and adding one. And finally, we, we know what will the size of the output of this uh, course correlation be. And we can do the same similar thing for all the uh, columns in the image minus the number of columns in the template plus one. And we know how many common columns there will be in this uh, output from this uh, template match. Um, and in OpenCV, there's this uh, match template method that actually implements uh, template matching where you provide an image and a template and also the method you want to use for, for calculating the, the difference. And depending on what type of differences you actually want to detect, you will use different uh, um, template match um, differences. This is a, the square difference I just showed you before. And then after having used this uh, match template, you will usually uh, use a min max lock to locate the, the best match. It's not always needed, but in, in some cases, it's uh, good to know where the, the best possible match of, of your template is present. So the output of this uh, template matching is we have uh, a few locations where the difference is uh, zero because the template actually matches it. And that occurs at the exact locations where we would expect them to be. Which is uh, the locations of, um, of the objects we were searching for. So um, just to, to sum up when uh, does this uh, template matching uh, work? Because there are some limitations in it. And um, we should have a template that actually match matches the target we are searching for. So if we don't know how the target is looking, we are not able to use template matching. The template and the target should have the same size. That is, uh, I, I can't use a template of a big question mark to to locate a much uh, smaller question mark in, in the same image. And um, the, the final thing here is that we should pay attention to the orientation because uh, we'll just put the template straight on top. And if we uh, rotate the, um, the target just a bit, uh, 30, 40 degrees or how much we, we want to, then we actually change the, the diff distance from the template to the target becomes too big to be able to detect it like this. So template matching doesn't work for, for this uh, scenario. But if we have the same size and the same orientation, then it actually works quite well in, in locating things. So again, it, it depends on what the purpose of and, and when you will be able to, to apply it. Okay, we have a, a bit of time for, for a few questions here, if that shows up, um, then we take a break and can continue afterwards from, from there. Okay, then we'll take a, uh, okay. You are good on the go. There were one comment, fine. Um, let's take a break to five minutes past one and then uh, we can go on from, from there. Yeah, let's take the, the next step here. So we earlier we talked about uh, template matching and now we would like to go on to motion estimation. And the uh, idea here is to actually have um, 
an idea of how motion from one frame to to the next frame uh, is actually uh, um, is is taking place. Um, <coughs> I will both uh, use some some uh, yeah text to describe what uh, takes place here and also make a, a few drawings uh, under the way, um, and then we will finally try to apply these methods on some images, and I would like to demonstrate the, the results to you. So um, the idea here is that we actually have uh, two images. And from these two images, uh, we would like to compare them and uh, see, OK, in, in the first image, we have uh, an object here. And in the next image, um, the object has uh, moved uh, slightly, um, like this. But how um, is the motion of all the elements in, in this image? Um, so is the uh, head moving to, to the right, or is this arm moving upward, and this leg downwards, or, or what is actually happening? We want to track the motion of all pixels. And there are actually there, there are two different ways of, of approaching this, either based on what is known as uh, feature-based methods, where we detect some locations that are easy to detect. We will get back to how to do that in, uh, in a later lecture, where we'll discuss uh, feet, uh, detectors like SIFT and SURF. But that will be in two weeks' time, uh, I think. Um, and also locate certain textured areas, and then it's possible to see. Okay, I found a location, uh, a feature in the first image. Where does that appear in the second image? And um, in that way, you can find a single point up here and, and see. Okay, where will that uh, move us to? There is a different class of methods named uh, dense methods that. Um, that tracks only a single point in that image, but all points in the, the image. So we get a, a whole mapping from all locations in the first image to where we expect these uh, pixels to, to end up in the next image. And um, to do that, we usually have to assume something, because that's what the methods are based upon. And in this case, the assumption is that uh, brightness of the object is uh, constant. Um, and we will look a bit more detailed, a bit more detailed into what that actually means when we will uh, derive um, a method for doing uh, optical flow. And for practical reasons, we make some simplifications and the calculations which makes these methods only work quite well for small movements. And by being a bit creative, it's possible to account for that and uh, actually make it work also for, for bigger movements. But um, that, apply, that requires us applying the method multiple times on, on the image at uh, different uh, uh, scales, for instance. So let's uh, take a look at how such an algorithm for dense optical flow can uh, look like. And what we are searching for here is the apparent motion of objects or points in, in that image, where we have two constraints on, on this motion. The first is that the brightness is the same, and the second is that the motion is small. And what we want to end up with is uh, that we have some kind of uh, object uh, here. Um, so, and the position of the object at time t, at x of t, is x of t comma y of t, and we have the timing here. So this is the position of the object we want to track in the frame at uh, time t, and that should be equal to the intensity of the new position of that object at t plus uh, 1 here, and y also at uh, t plus 1 at frame number t plus 1. So the brightness constancy is essentially this uh, equal sign. 
in practice, uh, we can have an, an object which uh, changes brightness over time. So that would um, make these calculations a, a bit more uh, cumbersome to, to go through if, if possible at all. We also have this idea about uh, using a, a small motion and that allows us to take some of these elements out of the equation uh, by linearizing it. And uh, that uh, helps us in, in the further calculation. So let's take a look at what actually happens. Yeah. So the idea is instead of having um, this uh, the position as t, that will be denoted uh, x, and the position at uh, x t plus one is uh, x plus u. So the motion from the first point to to the from t to t plus one will be u, or that will be the speed of that uh, uh, location we're looking at. And similar for, for the y, that's just a, a v coordinate down here. And what we want to subtract here is to say, okay, um, we have the image after the motion at t plus one and the image prior to the motion at, at t here. So we can see, okay, zero, it should be identical to zero because of this uh, brightness, constant brightness assumption. And then we can rewrite this in uh, in different ways. The first thing is to take the expression up here and then say, okay, I really would like to have this part of u moved outside of this equation. And the approach to that is to make a Taylor expansion where we assume that u is small and replace u inside here, moving moves it out and then uh, multiplies it with the derivative of the intensity function with respect to x at that point and multiply the, the distance we are moving. And the similar thing can be done for the v part where we multiply it with the uh, um, position or intensity derivative with respect to the y position and multiply with the distance here. So these two elements can be moved out. And uh, the next part that can be uh, changed is um, to compare these two elements. That is the intensity of the xy pixel at t plus one with uh, the intensity at, at the previous frame. And since we have a, a, a distance in time between the two frames of one, we will have the change in illumination or intensity at uh, that pixel be this uh, i of t. And then we can add the changes in the x and y coordinates um, based on the derivative with respect to x multiplied with u and plus the derivative of intensity with respect to y multiplied with v. And we can also write that as some kind of uh, equation down here where we have the uh, gradient of the intensity, um, so nabla i. Uh, and the dot product of uh, the motion vector um, composed of u and v as uh, input here. And we can in, in principle set up this equation for all pixels in that image because we can compute um, the change in intensity for a certain pixel and we can compute the image gradient for all pixels in that image. But what we are left with here is uh, two unknowns. So we have two unknowns, and we only have one equation. And that's a bit problematic because uh, it takes an equation to determine one unknown. Um, so somehow we need to figure out additional equations um, for to be able to, to find these uh, unknowns. So the question is now where we can search for these additional uh, constraints that can help us uh, locate the, the true motion. And uh, one approach to that is instead of only tracking the motion 
of uh, a single pixel, we will be tracking um, the motion of a small patch consisting of uh, five by five uh, pixels. So we still have our central pixel in, in the center. And around that, um, we will set up a similar equation for all of these. So this was our central pixel. So that gives us one equation. And we assume that the motion is the same for all of these uh, 25 uh, cells uh, here. Because for each cell, we can uh, calculate the change in intensity and uh, image gradient. And when these are known, uh, we get one equation per, per element here. So now we end up with uh, 25 cells and uh, two unknowns which can be solved using a, a least squared method. And then we can do the same thing for, for the pixel next to that and, and so on. And that works uh, reasonably uh, well. And you're able to track uh, the, the points you actually want to do with uh, here. One major issue is this works as long as this approximation is good. That is, uh, the motion is uh, quite small. And to be able to deal with that, um, different approaches can be done. And one of those are to use uh, what is known as image uh, pyramids. So at the bottom of the pyramid, we have an image in full resolution. That is our usually our normal input image. And then each time we step one step up in the pyramid, we reduce uh, the size of the dimension, maybe scale it down by a factor of two, and then uh, we can do that uh, once again. And the idea here is that um, if we have a very large motion in the input image, we scale the image down multiple steps, and then we do the analysis in, in this level. And if we don't detect a, a large um, uh, displacement in that image, we can do the analysis as uh, even you know, at a more fine-grained uh, level uh, if needed. It's also possible to do the analysis from the top here. And then actually, OK, I have estimated the motion in this layer to be in a following pattern. And then I use that information to warp, warp um, the layer below. So it actually cancels out that motion, because then we have a smaller motion in that compared to the previous frame. And we can repeat this process once again uh, all the ways down in, in the process. And this is what is known as a pure model Lucas Canada uh, algorithm uh, that, that does this. The algorithm we uh, discussed here is uh, the, the Lucas Canada, and that's also implemented in, in OpenCV. And I'll just try to see if I can find some code that uh, will uh, demonstrate this. So hang on for, for a short while. So I hope it will uh, show up in, in just a moment. And it actually did here. So what is being tracked here is a set of points. Um, and for each of these points, let's see if we can uh, add it here. It is uh, drawn on top of the frame where it's uh, moving and where its uh, history have, have, have been on, on that frame. And it's implemented using uh, Lucas Canada um, in, in OpenCV. And I have a different sample. I just need to move the my cursor.
but it's the same sequence as uh, before. But uh, what is shown over here is um, how the, the motion actually is uh, updated or is detected from frame to frame. And uh, the color coding given here um, also describes the direction of the detected motion. So things are, that are moving from uh, left to right appear red up here. And if someone is moving in, in a different direction, it will get a, a different uh, color here. So in that way, we're able to, to see how things are, are moving and in uh, what directions. I'll just try to start it once again, and then you can probably see how uh, the motion is detected initially with this uh, cyan color that changes to, yeah, I think it's cyan most of the time. Um, and then when the direction of the motion reverses, um, the color is uh, changed here. Compared to the frame before, I um, have done something to to reduce the computational load on, on my computer by scaling down the images, um, because some of these calculations can actually take some time to do. And I also cheated a bit in, in a different way. That is, I only compared motion not between adjacent frames, but between um, uh, frames where I skip uh, every second uh, frame. So if I have frame one, it will be compared to frame three, for instance, and, and so on. That makes the motion um, between the frames a bit larger and therefore a bit easier to, to see here. There are some things that you can experiment with in, with this uh, setting. And um, yeah, oh, hang on a, a moment. Um, I'll just try to show you um, this uh, different uh, image file, how that can uh, look like. I just had to, to modify a file here. It should be more or less available now. It just takes a moment to, to download that file from, from YouTube. Five seconds more. I think it should be be running now. Just a moment, then uh, we can see what comes in and out. So here we have a frame acquired by uh, a UAV. Um, I can see I actually want to modify the, the color encoding a bit over here to make it uh, more easy to see what actually is, is detected of, of motion. This is an example of some uh, drone footage from one of the intersections here in, in Odense. Um, it's between Ring 2 and uh, 
I think it's um, one of the, the streets down here. Uh, this is a hospital you can see over here. It's Sønder Boulevard that goes through here. What we can see in the analyzed motion up here is actually the, the motion of, of the traffic. Um, and for most of the time, we can see that uh, there is a certain direction of uh, the vehicles driving in, in one direction here. It's uh, Magenta. And the cars going in the opposite direction is uh, green. And um, we can also see that a few vehicles are, are moving around over here. Um, but there's one issue here with uh, an approach like this. And um, that is we are using a, a flying uh, camera here which is not steady so it will actually shift a bit in, in position over time um, so if you want to to do this in, in a proper way um, this shift should probably be uh, taken care of by, by some somehow either some image stabilization or yeah uh, a, a different approach for, for that I don't think we'll have time to, to discuss that uh, a bit later in the, in the course. But given an image like this, it's actually possible to, to track the motion of, of objects over time and see, okay, where are they and how do they move and change the, their motion. And I think it's quite fascinating to be able to, to see this or get these uh, analysis results uh, just by, by looking at a video and that the computer do this uh, processing. So far, so good. Yes. Um, I just want to round up here. Um, just to quote Niels Bohr, an expert is a man who has made all the mistakes which can be made in a very narrow field. Um, I'm on that path. I try to make a, a lot of mistakes in, in the code and approaches I take, but at least I get to get away of those and move on a, a bit from, from there. So hopefully I'm on the way and actually I hope you are on the same path right now. Um, it's not an issue to, to make mistakes as part of a, a course or an, an education as long as you, you learn from it. Actually, I try to put you in positions where you'll make different kinds of mistakes of when you should implement things, but then you should probably also uh, learn something from that in, in the best of, of uh, in the best case. What I expect to do the next couple of, uh, of lectures will deal with, and yeah, today we dealt with analysis of video sequences. Next week we will look into fiducial markers, that is uh, markers you can put into a scene which will help you analyze that scene and, and somehow. Then uh, we'll also look into key point detection and how to determine the apparent camera motion uh, between two frames. Have an Easter holiday. And finally, we'll try to combine this information into a visual odometry system. So we can use a camera feed to estimate how the, the UAV is uh, moving which will also be the topic of the second mini project. And what we'll fill up the, the rest of the course with is uh, not completely decided yet, but uh, we'll figure that out when we get a bit closer. I'll stop the recording now, and if there are any questions, then uh, let me know. And 